work in uh, Chemistry Council's working group on uh, catalysis has been doing with opportunities and challenges with the shell. Please, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Bill. And before you go too far away, I have a question for you. Uh, not you, Bill. Oh, okay. You, can, you don't have to go away, but you can go. <laughs> have you ever seen a glypidon? No. No. How about a uh, mastodon? It's an eight. For the show of hands, we're going to have a participatory uh, session here. Um, giant, bronze and lot. Have you seen any of these? Uh, Living or dead? Hmm? Living or dead? That's the thing, right? <laughs> All these things are very extinct. Uh, starting about 50,000 years ago, all the large terrestrial herbivores started to go away. And there's an assignable cause for this. So as a, a little bit of an interactive um, part to this session, uh, turn to your neighbor and talk about this issue. See if you come up with the answer, then put your arm up when you've got the answer. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. So, um, and I, I think my co-authors are going to pass out our booklets uh, while, we're, while we're talking about life in the past. Go ahead. We're all friends here. Right? <laughs> population about 100,000 years ago was maybe 100,000 individuals, hard to know for sure, but it's an order of magnitude estimate. This innovation doubled human lifespan on average, and it allowed for the population to increase by two or three orders of magnitude. But what you find, the paleontologists tell us, that any time humans encountered these uh, populations of large terrestrial herbivores, they were quite literally dead meat. This has a parallel to what we're dealing with now. We've heard a lot about uh, shale gas, and we've talked a little bit about energy. How does the uh, presenter work? Really? <laughs> you have to be a little bit closer to it. You have to be closer to the range. Okay, so we're going to start talking about energy, uh, because that's where our work as the working group all got started. Um, emissions is the problem with energy. Energy is the second best human innovation ever. And I mean, energy specifically from fossil fuels. Access to magnitudes of order, increased energy availability, allowed for division of labor and separation of human uh, activity from the products uh, of our work in order to do more with less. I really would like the next slide. <laughs> uh, but, Okay, so we'll wing it for a second. Um, this, is, this is a working group on catalysis. My, my co-authors, um, as we would get into the next slide, we can see the tremendous impact that shale gas has had on energy. Is that what we're working on? Well, uh, would you mind? Okay, thank you. So this this is another uh, interactive part of the presentation. I have nothing to carry on. I gesticulate wildly. So there's four possible answers here. Uh, since 2007, when CO2 emissions peaked, I sort of give the answer away now in the U.S., um, something has happened. So put up your hand with your answer one, two, three, or four, and somebody that's got the right answer will tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, yeah, so we got a couple fours over there. That is, of course, the right answer. Uh, what, do you, what do you know about our emissions? Um, and this is from all energy, transportation and electric. Well, there's been a lot of trends to more fuel efficient um, energy sources, um, as well as alternative technologies that offset some of the um, cycle. 
than in, in getting rid of coal, right? So displacing coal with natural gas uh, has been great for energy. It's also been great for uh, the business of chemistry. So uh, how did we get here today to be talking about uh, energy and uh, glyptodonts at a catalysis meeting? Uh, in 2011, uh, the G8 uh, contracted the IEA, commissioned the IEA, uh, to do a study on technology uh, to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, and they identified a number of sectors of the economy that had a large contribution to this and could have a large amount of leverage on changing it. Um, a lot of you know about the IEA work and the report that was generated. I've seen it cited and used in a number of the presentations. I think it's a great document for helping us understand as an industry what we can do to help change our footprint while still providing the benefits of the industry. Um, coming out of that work, uh, Ed Ryder was one of the co-chairs, Ed Ryder at Dow, one of our co-authors. Uh, he set up the working group on catalysis because uh, the IEA calls out specifically in their roadmap that catalysis has immense leverage uh, on changing the footprint of the chemical industry because almost every chemical process uh, uses a catalyst. So uh, we came together, there's uh, I think 26 of us now from 14 or 15 different companies. Uh, Ed had to step away from the working group to focus on other activities uh, last year or so. Uh, so I uh, took up the, the effort uh, along with, of course, all the uh, other people in the working group. We've, we've done a couple things uh, that a lot of you have participated in. We had a round table two years ago at AM24 uh, where we got a lot of really good deep technical insight from uh, experts both in industry and academia on different technologies that uh, could potentially be beneficial. Uh, and then there was a really important workshop last year at the National Academy. Uh, both those reports are out there publicly available. Uh, this uh, presentation today is uh, partially a sales job. It's partially a public outreach job. It's going to be less deep and less technical than the other presentations that we've had uh, in this session and at this meeting. Uh, and that's at least partially because I'm not a catalyst scientist by training, but I fortunately have a really good catalyst scientist on the working group with us. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is generate uh, buy-in. So if, the, if there's something that the industry can support, the industry group, the ACC, if there's something that the academic community can support, uh, I think we have an opportunity to really have some leverage and provide new opportunities for, uh, for our business and for our science. So here's, here's a little bit more back, we have a little bit more background, and then we'll go into sort of the technological things that we've been finding, uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, both a review of, of where, we, uh, came, where we came today, uh, and then a call to action. So this is how we were chartered by the ACC. Uh, the ACC is the uh, advocacy group, that means lobbying uh, for the chemical industry. All the big chemical companies are members of the ACC, and the ACC has really done some fantastic things. Uh, not just for the chemical industry, but for the general public. And uh, somebody else can tell you a lot more about that, or I could at a different time. But our charter was to elevate the interest in advancing R&D associated with catalytic processes. So that's part of the reason why we have the booklet. This is something for the general public, something for uh, people that aren't familiar with what we do. And the goal is to promote uh, these exchange and two big things that we'll come back to, the opportunities and the barriers. So these are plots that we've seen a lot uh, over the last several years. Um, it's worth sort of outlining them or contextualizing them uh, for the work that we've done. <coughs> the American Chemistry Council put together the plot on the left, and it showed how the cost of doing chemical business in the United States from 2005 uh, to the present day, uh, now the United States is either the best or the second best place in the world to start a chemical plant. And industry has responded in kind. There's a wave of investment that we're currently in the midst of, approaching now almost $200 billion. This is a really big deal because jobs in the chemical industry are really good. They pay well, they have benefits, they provide a lot of value to the people that do them. And the products that we make provide comfort, safety, <coughs> security, uh, food quality, the list goes on and on at lower cost and with some sustainability uh, that you don't get from traditional materials. Uh, so, uh, a word to our colleagues from other countries. This talk is very US centric, and I hope that some of what we talk about uh, you can take back to your home countries. I don't mean to be jingoistic, 
uh, but it is the American Chemistry Council uh, that's providing for this talk, so that, that is going to kind of be the focus. Um, the plot on the upper left here, this is right out of the IEA report. I thought uh, Paul Danauer did a nice job with this on Monday in his keynote. Uh, he, he turned it on its side, uh, and the point that he made from that really nicely was that if you look at methanol and ammonia, the things that come from methane, if you put those together, they're bigger than everything else combined. So anything that we can do on methane has a lot of leverage. Methane is also the hardest thing to work with, so it's, the challenge is sort of equal to the, uh, to the opportunity. Not only that, um, you can see that there's a lot of opportunity to work on uh, other materials that have uh, a lot of potential. There are ways to get to some of the gaps that are developing uh, C3, C4, C5 that are going to be extremely important uh, as uh, the shale gas revolution continues. Uh, but we are going to talk a lot about methane uh, for this reason. Another graphic here from the ACC, this is part of how we try to talk to the public about what our, uh, what our industry does and why it's worthwhile uh, to fund research uh, in making our industry more competitive and better. Right, so we wouldn't have done this 10 years ago, right? not just for economic factors, but there's uh, some convergence that are all really trending together, some, some megatrends or macro trends. Of course, we talked a little bit about shale gas and NGL already. Uh, and recent innovations, uh, when we've gotten together at the round table and at the workshop, certain things keep coming up over and over. Uh, certain fundamental research results that are really promising, that look exciting, and we'll highlight a couple of those uh, that really give us uh, a thought that uh, there's path forward to, to really make a transformational change in uh, how industry uh, does or can add to what industry does. The next next one for us. Uh, sorry, back please. I do want to talk about workforce uh, and environmental footprint. Uh, so a, a lot of us uh, in this room, I don't mean to be rude, but none of us are getting any younger. Uh, the workforce is, uh, is aging and we'll need to replace uh, the technicians, the chemists, the engineers uh, who brought us to where we are now and the, the wonderful technologies that we have. And we have to do this all while reducing the amount of emissions and footprint that we have. So coming out of the work that we've done uh, with uh, the academic community and in the working group uh, representing the uh, companies and industry that were shown earlier, uh, we came up with what we call the six pillars. Uh, so we'll go through these step by step uh, with some amount of uh, uh, with some amount of uh, detail, but uh, a lot of this you can get in the report, and a lot of this stuff you guys know already. Uh, next one, please. So fundamentals is first. It's first for a reason. Uh, it comes up over and over. Uh, active site design, uh, one of the, the main topics of a lot of the sessions, uh, being able to do an active, build together an active site uh, in a computer and then make it in the laboratory and see if it works the way that you thought it would. Uh, there's been uh, more acceleration in that area and that's uh, something that is, is low cost and potentially very helpful. Uh, fundamental thermodynamic studies, uh, like we've seen in this in this session already are incredibly helpful. Set the rules of the road. You get your floor and your ceiling. You can't go above and below. Uh, and then selectivity optimization, of course, is the key to any fundamental uh, catalyst improvement. Uh, this is a, a survey result from the round table. We did a pre-survey uh, when we did the round table two years ago. So this is why fundamentals always goes to the top of the list, because it's always at the top of everyone's list. We bring these together uh, because uh, we want to know what people think about what they think is important so that when we're asked, can you support this effort, the answer will be yes. Uh, next, please. Okay, thank you. Here's uh, just one study that we pulled uh, to highlight the kinds of results that uh, we think are very helpful uh, in developing technology uh, and moving, moving the ball down the field. This is a, this is a recent uh, review article. This is about uh, oxidative coupling and methane. Uh, next, please. So applied research wants some uh, technological possibilities have been identified, uh, either through simulation or through testing. Uh, let's get these out uh, onto the lab bench and see how they actually work. Uh, next one, please. Once you know your thermodynamics, anything that's not thermodynamics is kinetics, as my professor used to say. 
Uh, but as I'm learning, working with catalysis scientists, anything that's not thermodynamics or kinetics is transport. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so thank you for that already. Um, and I, I would say transport is nothing more than uh, slow kinetics. But uh, parametric, <laughs> parametric product distribution studies. So this is when you get something that was promising and you put your feeds through it, uh, like the mass spec results that we've seen, what are we actually getting out of this system? Uh, the in operando characterization, uh, we're really enamored with that. Can't say enough about it. Actually seeing acrocytes in work and how they're dynamic, um, as, as Bruce Gates said this morning, um, is really very, very important to under getting any hope of understanding how these things are working. Uh, physical and mechanical testing and improvement. So it was great to see a picture of the YouTube reactor in the last talk. So what kind of reactor system are you using and what are the effects that that has uh, on the results that you measure? Uh, one of the results that gets mentioned every time we get together, uh, so I, I'm getting on the bandwagon, is to talk about the uh, Bow paper uh, that was in Science in 2015. This is the non-oxidative coupling of methane. They're getting a lot of ethylene uh, and a lot of aromatics. Uh, this kind of research is uh, you know, pretty eye-opening and something that needs to be followed up on and replicated and extended. There's an, a nice in operando uh, example on the right that's from the, the Lex group, of course, uh, showing that you can tell the difference between different uh, proposed uh, active site models uh, by doing spectroscopy under operating conditions. Uh, next, please. So we're kind of going through the scaling idea once you get uh, some uh, demonstrated activity and you've got some practical information. You've got to try to scale this up into a, uh, something that can work like kilo uh, pilot plant and demo plant if, if you're very successful and very lucky. And operando, uh, another one of the things that we hear from the community and uh, gets talked about in, in uh, dovetails with my own experience is that simulations are really powerful. Uh, for a lot of situations. Uh, they're very good at post facto explaining the results that you get, uh, but it's very hard to get, say, a DFT calculation to talk to a molecular mechanics a simulation, to talk to a finite element simulation of a reactor system. At least part of that is because there's physics we don't understand. We can't capture everything in these models, and we can't uh, <coughs> calculate on every relevant time scale all the time. Computing power is getting better all the time, uh, but having some sort of rules of the road or standardization of how these simulations can work together to really do a uh, multi-component simulation at multiple scales uh, would be a nice uh, improvement and an uh, ambitious goal. Uh, flexible and accessible test beds. Imagine for a moment, if you will, uh, you've discovered something on the bench, uh, something that works really well. If there were a user facility that you could travel to uh, where uh, professional uh, technicians and engineers helped you set that up at a larger scale, um, gave you access to uh, their facilities, and this was something that was funded, you know, maybe in a matching way, maybe on the user access model that the, the National Labs use. Uh, and this could lead to potentially discovering some of the scaling principles that are currently um, sort of historical lore within companies um, and generated empirically. And this is something that we see as having cross-cutting impact. Scaling is important. Uh, only when you're trying to make stuff. And that's really what we're trying to do. This is an example. We could have picked any number of examples. This is Solaria. Um, but it's uh, really a testament to uh, the courage and the tenacity of the people that have done this work to run this demo plant for a year. Uh, so, so there are a lot of examples, but I don't, we don't think there's a better one. Uh, but this is exactly the sort of thing that we'd like to see more of. This is in the public interest. This is something that the public should uh, help us work on. Um, it's also meant to highlight the idea that we're not suggesting something that can't be done. Right? This is practical, it's achievable. Uh, there are examples of this uh, having been done in the past and currently. So as you get to scale, we start talking a lot about integrated design. So this is how you put your plant together. Uh, chemical engineering uh, at its finest. Uh, process intensification uh, is, is basically a fancy way of saying do more with less. Uh, reactor design is something that uh, we'd like to see more research on and uh, continue to extend a lot of the fine work that's being done in this area. Uh, integrating power and understanding your heat and mass flows 
and how those affect your whole plant operation uh, is really important research to be done, uh, and as well as separations. We have perhaps my favorite example uh, in the separations slide. This is a canonical uh, example due to Eastman, uh, where our co-chair is, is from in the session. Uh, so you've got 15 process units and 500 meters of pipes and 1,000 valves. Uh, you can reduce that to one process unit. This is the Eastman process for making uh, methyl acetate process intensification in a nutshell. I'm borrowing from uh, Dr. Brooker, uh, our Hoodry Award winner. Uh, this was something that you said at the uh, Changing Landscape um, workshop, and it, it really stuck with a lot of us in the working group. Almost every advance in petrochemical processes came about because of the invention of a new material. And we just picked out a few that we can cite as uh, success stories there. Uh, the basic understanding of materials, especially the materials of construction for reactors, for supports, et cetera, is really uh, very important and powerful, and a lot of that data just doesn't exist. Uh, next one, please. We often think about uh, purification, separation, recycle as ancillary processes, but if we want to take a technology and make it go in the real world, they're not ancillary at all. They're very, very important. They're critical to understanding if you're going to make any money with the process uh, or if you're going to lose your shirt. Uh, there are examples of the, the road to success is littered with uh, failed commissionings and plants that never operated. And I think it's partially because of this. So the, this example here is a steam cracker, uh, best in class type uh, implementation. About half of the money that you spend to build the thing uh, you spend out your separations and recycle your compressors and your turbos, and about 80% of the operating expense once you've got it up and going uh, is keeping all that stuff running. So, the actual chemistry that you do is just like kind of a small part of it, very important part. But and the other thing to mention there is that selectivity has such huge, huge uh, leverage too. If you can make a one or two percent relative improvement in selectivity, well, you can really move the needle. Uh, we've talked sort of in principle about the type of funding that we think it would take to address some of these challenges, uh, capitalize on the opportunities that we have. So uh, next one, please. Uh, this, is a, this should be a national priority. Um, companies are going to start making a lot of money with uh, shale gas. They are, are making a lot of money. We are making a lot of money with shale gas. And we should reinvest some of that uh, to form these public-private partnerships uh, to fund uh, to fund the HAGA or an institute. Uh, next one, please. So here's, here's a graphical representation of the, the kind of money that we're talking about. We've kicked around uh, 15 to $30 million to really uh, get us going pretty well. Uh, and for scale, uh, you can see the, the pink circle. That's the amount that many of these funding agencies provide currently for chemical research. And the big blue circle uh, is the amount of money that the chemical industry makes in sales every year. Well. Actually, that's not quite true. Well, we've got a scaling issue here. Next one. It's actually like this. <laughs> the factor of a thousand in there. So, um, can you go back? So, the chemical industry does about eight hundred billion dollars in U.S. sales. Uh, the U.S. chemical company. So, if you look at what we're benefiting from this research, uh, that the people in this room do, uh, and what we've done with it, um, we can anticipate a fairly good ROI. Uh, next, please. Uh, so what, one of the things that we talk about a lot uh, is what, do you, what, do you, what would you do with that money, and some of the ideas that we have next, please. So we imagine something like a user facility, as I mentioned before, uh, where you have a national laboratory or a university or some other nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, non-commercial uh, entity managing that with a shared access model. Uh, so the people that have good ideas can test them out at a bigger scale. Uh, and this would require public-private partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. And one really great example of this, I've heard a lot of uh, side conversations about Rapid today. That's really a, a success story for, uh, for Aki uh, getting this funding for this uh, NNMI project. It's going to be $70 million over the next 10 years, um, divided up into six focus areas, one of which is chemical processing. Um, and it's really focused on process intensification. So 
it, it's an example of how public private partnerships have come together in the past. I'm not saying that um, process intensification is on, the only thing we should look at, far from it. Uh, we would propose calling it the basic hydrocarbon conversion research, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I talked in the beginning uh, about um, human lifespan and about quality of life. And I, I didn't address whether or not that's a good thing. Right? So you've got an upside, you've got a downside. You've got uh, the poor glyptodonts who are all dead now, and you've got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's causing global warming. So I want to get real personal to analyze this question just for a minute. Um, my dad is uh, 72 years old, and I was talking to him on the phone a couple months ago. And he said, uh, I said, okay, well, it sounds good, Dad. What else should you do? He said, well, I'm going to get married. So, <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> uh, this was sort of news to me. I knew he had a lady friend. I think when you get to be 70, you don't have a girlfriend, you have a lady friend. Uh, <laughs> we, so we're, we're going down to, uh, to, to see my dad at his place. He's going to get married. And, I'm with my two daughters. My wife had got sick, so she, oh, she couldn't come with us. It's a little bit of a stressful time, you know, you got the kids yelling and whatever. And we get to the hotel and my three-year-old's jumping on the bed. Says, Would mommy let you jump on the bed? No. Is mommy here? No. So let's jump on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> we had a really great time and then at the wedding, um, my dad's getting married, the officiant is saying the thing, my eight-year-old is going up trying to see what's in the, in the book and uh, trying to see what the rings look like. And, um, just imagine the joy that I felt to have three generations of our family there to see my dad in the third act of his life experience uh, real joy. Um, what a great moment. Um, I'm only able to do this because I have a job and I have a lot of leisure time. Uh, and that's, that's what we're after here. The chemical industry provides that sort of a lifestyle uh, for the people that do that. And you all, with the excellent work that you do, uh, training our students and providing for the general good, uh, that's what we want to do more of. That's why this is important. So we've got the list of the potential benefits and potential losses here. It basically focuses on the things that we've been talking about, getting more money back into the industry so that we can continue the innovation and growth uh, that provide these benefits. And potential losses are, uh, as you can imagine, the world is going to change. You don't have to imagine. You know it's going to change. You just don't know how it's going to change. Um, and as I get into the conclusion here, next slide, please. Uh, we want to spend a little bit of time addressing the question that we get very regularly uh, from funding agencies, from this community, uh, and very often from our managers. Uh, what does industry want? Uh, so we promised that we would uh, give some commentary on this, and uh, this was some of the things that we came up with. Uh, the 20% improvement in figures of merit, uh, this is a, sort of a risk-reward calculation. right? So if you're deploying a new technology, it can't offer an incremental improvement in performance. It has to be a lot better. So to get the attention of industry, whether that figure of merit is selectivity, conversion, energy efficiency, capital, name, name it. If it's a really significant improvement, one part of five, uh, that's going to get a lot of interest. Uh, value of death. So this is where a good projects are going to die. Uh, you get off the bench, try to go to scale. You have scale problems. Uh, the investment runs out. What looked like a really promising technology never gets commercialized. Corporations exist for only one reason, to generate um, shareholder value. So corporations are very risk adverse. Now, if you wanted to say that we should spend time talking to people who are shareholders and say that you should change your value system, I would support that. But I don't think it's the best way to go about it. I think the best way to go about it uh, is to advocate uh, for more funding for the work that we're already doing. You know, do what you're already good at, sort of idea. Uh, Public-private partnerships, we've talked about that uh, a little bit. Uh, and reinvesting in what we're doing uh, for additional growth and, and to fund technological uh, breakthroughs and innovation uh, to get economic growth, quality of life benefits, uh, sustainability, reduced footprint that's needed to uh, continue to improve everybody's stock. Next. A lot of acknowledgments. I won't read everybody's name. These are all printed in the, uh, the reports that we've published. It's just been a real pleasure for me uh, to work with this group of brilliant, hardworking, selfless, uh, selfless folks. Um, Want to also call out uh, Nam, uh, especially Professor Tasha, uh, who gave us this uh, very generously gave us this 40-minute slot uh, to uh, report out to all of you. Um, 
Shepherd Chemical, my employer, our uh, core purpose is to uh, generate value and to brighten lives. I think this effort really fits in with that very well. Uh, Katie uh, Taylor put together these slides. She's responsible for the graphic design. If you need any help with graphic design, technical writing, I'd recommend contacting her as soon as you can. Uh, the National Academy, of course, for, for everything that they do, not the least of which was hosting our uh, workshop uh, last year. And uh, Jennifer Scott at the American Chemistry Council has been an important uh, resource for us as we've done this work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So as, as I get into the conclusion of the talk, I'm going to ask uh, uh, for you to commit to do something to help us today uh, and, and to help our, our community. Our charter from the ACC was to uh, share opportunities and to describe uh, challenges. So as you're thinking about the big picture of transforming uh, light hydrocarbons through dehydrogenation or any other technology, if you can share those with us, we're, we're trying to build as much consensus as we possibly can, both between the academic community, the national labs, and industry, uh, to elevate interest in doing more of this. And then if you flip your booklet over, and all the booklets are out there now, uh, Greg's name is on the back there, you can contact him directly to get involved uh, with the ACC effort, uh, both in catalysis research and, and other areas. Uh, and before I turn over to questions, let me ask you all a question. Are you buying what I'm selling? No. <laughs> I would like to talk to you more. <laughs> okay, so that's really been our task. Can we get, um, get enough buying for both sides and make something happen here? If the answer is yes, that's great. If it's no, that might be great too, because that means we have a lot more. Thank you very much for your attention. Take questions now.